All right, all right, all right. <clears throat> Let's get fired up here. Maximum freedom. Read. Stay on target. Maximum freedom. Stay on target. Maximum freedom. Read Rothbard. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the actual Anarchy podcast presented by your friends at readrothbard.com. Now run actualanarchy.com. It is live and it is bumping. So many articles have been posted on there the last couple of uh, days. It's only been up for less than a week. Isn't that right, Robert? Yeah, we want to thank all the good folks at the Tom Woods Facebook group who have been contributing content to the site. It has really come alive. Um, If it was just Daniel and myself putting up content, it wouldn't be anywhere near what it is right now. If you haven't checked it out yet, check it out. Actualentity.com. Lots of good content and lots more to come. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, it's still a little bit of a work in progress. Um, we started putting up articles uh, written by people, of course, and then we've also got uh, Amazon links on there. But all of our other main content information is over at readrothpower.com, so that's still going to be a viable thing going on. We run this podcast, the Actual Anarchy Podcast, uh, where we talk about movies from an anarcho-capitalist perspective. Uh, but we also host Enemy of the State, which are lectures by Murray Rothbard. And we host Reed Rothbard, which used to be the one about the movies, but now it is audiobooks by Murray Rothbard. So check out those movie or uh, check out those podcasts on iTunes. Uh, the actual Anarchy podcast will be on iTunes very soon, and so we'd like to ask you guys to do us a favor and rate or comment or share or whatever it is you do on iTunes uh, for this podcast, so that we can get a, a good shot at getting the new and noteworthy area uh, to get more listeners and spread the message of anarchy in the more positive sense that it is than what we see in the media uh, on the day-to-day basis with all these riots going on down in Berkeley. They're calling them anarchists. Um, but that's why we have actual anarchy to correct all of that. Yeah, and... Um Unfortunately, not breaking windows doesn't really garner big headlines. So help us get the word out. Appreciate it. So this episode is going to be about the movie starring Matthew McConaughey, The Dallas Buyers Club. And we have a special guest, and he is Doc Anarchy, and he runs DocAnarchy.com. And he is going to be joining us to talk about the film. Are you there, Doc? Yes, I am. Very nice to chat with you today. Yeah, thank you for coming on. Uh, we had attempted to have this call the, uh, the day before, but we had some inclement weather difficulties where I lost power here. So thank you for being flexible to come back on, and uh, we do appreciate it. So uh, do you want to give a uh, short introduction to yourself, how you came to uh, become Doc Anarchy, and how you became a libertarian, and a little bit of that, what you do, and promote anything you want uh, to tell the listeners. Certainly. Yes, I'm a uh, physician uh, here in the United States. Um, I'm uh, double board certified in physical medicine, rehabilitation, and also pain management. Um, and uh, I became much more interested in politics uh, during the Ron Paul campaign, um, which kind of shook things up, I think, for a lot of people who were paying attention. Um, and got, re- re- got me to uh, start reading. And, um, you know, what they say, once you go libertarian, uh, the difference between a libertarian and an anarchist is about six months of reading. Um, and that was the same for me. Um, and uh, now I hold the belief that, uh, you know, spontaneous order, uh, will occur in self-governance, and uh, uh, we don't need a top-down model um, that you can have rules without having rulers. 
and uh, society would work perfectly fine. Well said. And, yeah, and uh, the movie we're going to talk about right now, or today, is a really good instance, or an instance of that. It, it's, uh, gosh, I, when I, I was struck by it being just the most libertarian movie I, I had ever seen. Um, it, dramatically so, yeah. Yeah. It's all about a guy just trying to provide value to his customers and being thwarted at every turn by the machinations of government trying to limit him and prevent mm. him from doing it his way as opposed to their way. So, uh, yeah, it really I've, definitely does show the, uh, the cost of having, um, organizations like the FDA limiting your choices. Yeah. And the extreme cost to even get your drugs by them or pass them or what have you. Um, they can really just kind of gatekeep from people that wouldn't necessarily have the bankrolls of the established pharma companies to push their drugs through. And, of course, increasing the massive costs, which get passed on to the consumer, which are the essentially the hidden costs of death. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. if you can't afford all these drugs... Yeah, uh, perfect example of the seen versus the unseen. I mean, people see that the FDA... You know, supposedly prevented them from having a bad a bad drug, uh, but they don't see the unseen cost of, you know, people dying without even being able to try anything. Right. And the moral choice of whether you have this, the ultimate say in what goes into your body or if someone else does. Um, so let me give a brief synopsis, and then we can take it down scene by scene, and then we can get into all the rabbit trails that uh, will ensue from it. So this is based on a true story. Um, as Daniel said, it stars Matthew McConaughey in the lead role. And, uh, boy, he's one of those guys that really just melds into, like changes his body. Because he really did. He looked like a guy who had AIDS. Um, as in my mind's eye of what a guy back in like the 80s or 90s had AIDS. They didn't didn't look so good, not like your Magic Johnson types. Um, oh, yeah. uh, so this is a, a real nine, real guy named Ron Woodruff, and it basically lays out his fight to provide value to um, his customers who weren't super excited or wanted alternative medications than what was approved by the FDA at the time. Um he uh, basically just outlines his battle um, from being diagnosed with HIV to wanting to get in the AZT trial where he would have a 50-50 chance of actually getting the drug or a placebo, which wasn't good enough for him. So he's like, no, I'm going to go my own way. And so he ends up um, making a deal with a hospital staff guy who was able to get him some drugs kind of on the down low. And he ends up basically overdosing, taking too high of a dose. And I don't know if the actual medical term is to go into like toxic shock or whatever, but they say he almost died. Um, So he ends up down in Mexico with a doctor who didn't have a license or whose license had been revoked. And I'm exactly, I forget exactly why that was. But his no, doctor never prescribes said. all these alternate treatments. I'm sorry, what? Oh, they never said why he lost his license. Hmm. But, um, I mean, do you have any kind of issue? I mean, the whole licensing issue. Um, right. From my point of view, it's a, it's like a market mechanism. Like, hey, this guy went through the, these hoops to get a license. But the fact that a guy is licensed or not shouldn't prevent a person from being able to provide value in a market. Certainly, and we see that all the time. I mean, uh, um, and people are, I, th- I think there's, let me backtrack a little bit, because I think there's the, um, this artificial divide between, you know, what's health and what's health advice. And, uh, um, you know, people have kind of broken up all of these um, different service providers artificially. 
um, because you, you go to the doctor when you have these certain types of illnesses. When you're not feeling your best or you want to lose weight, you know, you, you can go to a nutritionist or you can just go to a personal trainer, which has very little licensing. Or you can just go to the Internet and say, how do I lose weight? How do I feel better? How do I boost my testosterone? How do I, you know, calm down this symptom? How do I get rid of leg cramps? I mean, all this stuff is readily available, and that's all within the realm of, of health. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's, um, especially with the Internet now, there's so much information that's available. And I, I really think that uh, having the licensing requirements of a physician um, that are mandatory um, through, you know, if you uh, aren't a physician and you're practicing um, and, or you're telling people that you are a physician and you're uh, instructing them on what to do, um, it, it can carry some pretty stiff penalties, including jail time. Um, so, uh, at the same time, um, it's very difficult to become a full-fledged MD, board certified, all this rigmarole, um, and, Right, which, uh, artificially limits competition, right? Uh, exactly. Uh, but when you really break it down to, you know, one specific disease state versus another, um, the current training as an MD is uh, very broad, and then eventually you specialize. But you get this incredibly broad training in all these different body parts and all these different mechanisms and the chemistry of all these different things and the physiology of every organ. Um, but it's been fairly frequent that someone's come to my office who's had an extremely rare condition um and I say, well, I think I remember in the textbook kind of the outline of that. And they say, well, here's all of the information about my condition and what it is and how it works. And, and they're much more of an expert on that because they have a vested interest in that. Um, and that patient would potentially be a much better resource to other people um, who have that same condition as a self-taught patient than myself as a physician who's had, you know, 13 years of education after high school um, because they have a very specific interest in own self-preservation um, to really dig in to that uh, specific topic. Um, right. So you're giving like so there's your, all these... your endorsement to Ron then in the movie. Right. Um I mean, he, uh, no one has a more, uh, <laughs> encouragement to really understand their condition, uh, than the patient with some type of a rare condition. And at that time, uh, HIV and AIDS was rare, was unknown. And, um, uh, right, cause this is like about 1987 no or so, I want to say, is the actual right. time frame of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I never quite, uh, I, I don't remember the actual time frame. I mean, they had changed it um, over, and they might have just done this in the movie for PC reasons. Um, uh, HIV used to be called, uh, oh, I'm going to have to Google this up, because it was like um, uh, gay immune deficiency syndrome or something like that. Seriously? Um, yeah. Well, wow, because, yeah, in the, the movie... Um you really get a sense of how little was known. And as a child growing up in the 80s, I remember how little was known. But in the movie, they really show just the fear because all his friends, once they find out he has AIDS, or HIV at least, they all assume it's a queer homosexual disease and they all hate him and call him queer and don't want to hang out with him anymore. And, oh, man, he touched right. me, you know. Yeah. Freak and it's, uh, it was called Gay-Related Immune Deficiency uh, or GRID was what its first little name was. Huh. But it's just, I mean, shows um, how they had no idea what it was. They just noticed right. that uh, homosexual populations started having these uh, illnesses from little bacteria and funguses that 
almost never affected anyone. Um, right. And they had these rare cancers, and uh, then they started digging into it and figured out what it was. And Ron, in the movie, he's a very sexually promiscuous man, and he also does a lot of drugs. Um, Mm -hmm. But to his credit, once he finds out he has HIV, we don't see him having sex with anybody else that is not have HIV. He he has sex with one woman who has full-blown AIDS at one point, but um, it's actually a bit of a drama for him in the movie. So... um, Let's break it down a little bit scene by scene, starting uh, I out thought a with... a very funny part of the movie where, where he's like, Who, who's that female? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, who's that good-looking lady over there? Is she a patient? <laughs> um, so Ron is a bull rider, and he kind of has a history of selling like performance enhancing drugs to other bull riders. And our first scene is um, he's dealing with some unhappy customers who attack him and want to get him. So he's running away from them. And because the, uh, the product that he gave them didn't perform as advertised, he's like giving them some sort of drug and they're like, yeah, you'll be able to stay on the full eight seconds with this drug. And so after the rodeo and the, the drug doesn't work, uh, they come and try and get him, and he seeks the aid of a policeman who uh, is unwilling to protect him. Uh, so he ends up punching the cop just to get arrested. Um, Daniel, did you do you want to make any kind of comment about the nature of um, serve and protect cops at that point? Well, it, it was a little bit compelling in that he he was basically not going to help him until he assaulted the officer. It, it ends up that he knows him, and so he was probably telling him he wasn't going to help him because he knows him, not because he wasn't doing the serve and protect thing. Though, if I recall, a couple of years ago, the Supreme Court ruled that a police officer actually has no duty to protect. And so it's a, a bit of a early, early uh, rendition Instance of that. of that, right, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think yeah, in the context of the film, it was because he knew him, and he was like, oh, Ron, you're up to your old tricks again, you know, and... Just figure your own shit out. Right, selling snake oil to people, and these are just some unhappy customers you should have known by now. Change your ways. Um, I mean, obviously, morally, just because you bought a product and it didn't work out for you, that doesn't give you the right to assault somebody. It's like, what are these people, like early early lefties (laughs) who are attacking people because uh, they don't believe in buyer beware, that sort of thing? I don't know. Um, so he's, uh, the next scene, he's a, an electrician, he's an electrician slash bull rider, and, uh, he gets electrocuted on the job, wakes up in a hospital where they tell him he has HIV, and they give him 30 days to live. And, um, from then on, he just, like you said, Doc, he digs into it and does his research, and he determines that he needs some AZT, and, which, if you could talk about, I'm not sure if you know, I mean, in the movie they talk about how AZT is this drug that specifically targets the virus itself. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it's, um, uh, I mean, this isn't, I'm I'm not an infectious disease specialist, but, uh, yeah, it's uh, an antiretroviral drug um, that uh, eventually became uh, quite successful and was the first main drug to, uh, um, to be used to treat HIV. Uh, it wasn't very good as a solo treatment because the HIV virus, the reason there's no vaccine for the HIV virus as of yet is because it mutates very quickly. Um, and so the, it, uh, the AZT um, didn't work very well long term because uh, the virus uh, became immune to it pretty quickly. But now that they have... Um, uh, different cocktails, um, and combine AZT. It's still the first line, um, but in a combination with others and at a much lower dose. So you're kind of seeing the beginning stages as, as they're, um, working through, uh, this process of, uh, kind of refining the product, 
Uh, I thought it was interesting. Well, I guess it's a little bit later that FDA kind of comes in. We'll chat about it then. We definitely will. Um, one thing I really identified with Ron with was he took it upon himself to get educated about a thing. And he just wants it. He just wants to get some. And he should just be able to get some. It exists out there in the world. And he's like, okay, I want to buy some. Can you sell me some? And the doctors are like, no, it can't do it that way. What we can do, according to the FDA, is get you into this trial. Well, you'll have a 50-50 chance of actually getting the drug. And he's like, well, you gave me 30 days to live. I think I need it like now. Can you just, you know? So uh, from the start, I was just with him the whole time. This is a guy that just wants, you know, to get shit done. He he wants to live. <laughs> and as a market service, they were not, they weren't servicing him. So he took it upon himself to get the job done himself. Which uh, so I was cheering him on the whole way. Um, and he had no problems and no qualms with, you know even basically stealing it from the hospital because they wouldn't sell it to him. So he makes it like this deal with some hospital worker um, who's stealing it from the trial, I suppose, and then acts like he's going to go out and throw it away and actually give it to Ron. Do, did any of you guys have any kind of like moral problems with that? Yeah, I mean, that's always the um, the, the tricky moral grounds uh, when – uh, there's a, uh, a patient who needs something, um, and, uh, is denied access to that, um, but you're taking property. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. then you, you come into a situation of, um, uh, of, uh, you know, where does your own kind of morality lie, um, and, uh, and the real question is, is, was the person even thinking of it in moral terms or was he just looking to get a buck? Um, mm-hmm. And uh, uh, well, ultimately, uh, we never know. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, just because you have a thing doesn't mean you have any kind of obligation to sell it to anybody else if you don't want to. Um, the, the hospital could have a supply of a thing and not want to sell it to him, but that wasn't the case. They were prevented from selling it to him by the force of violence from the DEA saying you're not allowed to. Right. So it gets kind of muddy, um, as it is always when you're dealing with the government. Um, I mean, he just, he was perfectly willing to pay for it, <laughs> but they wouldn't let him. So mm. I guess when you're, when your life is on the line, are you just going to lay down and die, or are you going to kind of compromise your morality a little bit? I think that's an interesting thing. Right. So, um, so yeah, he uh, ends up getting it, and he doesn't follow any kind of dosing, as far as he knows, maybe, or he just takes a few at a time. It's not really, I don't remember it being super clear on whether he knew to take a certain amount or not, but he ends up essentially overdosing him. And when he's recovering... He um, he meets up with this character played by Jared Leto, who's in the trial for AZT, and um, he ends up checking himself out of that hospital while he's recovering, even though the uh, Jennifer Garner character, the doctor lady, um, says, you know, we can make your last days comfortable. And he's like, lady, I'm going to die with my boots on. I'm not going to just lay down and die on some morphine drip. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I was cheering for him there. Like, hell yeah, man. Don't, don't just take what's offered to you. Go out and get what you want. Um, mm-hmm. so he ends up going down to Mexico where he finds this doctor who's, doesn't have a license, um, but he ends up treating him with, uh, alternate drugs. Takes him off of AZT and puts him on peptide T and a few other things. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, there's some other retroviral that, um, uh, he put him on, I forgot, it had another initial DDC or something like that. Um, was that the one that, that was, was from the, in uh, Europe, I believe? Was he on the one from the Caterpillars? Or was that later on? Uh, that was later on. That's uh, later on. 
but he um, he ends up kind of making a deal with his doctor, who has just boatloads of these drugs, and he's like, "You can make a make a fortune down here, doc. You just gotta get him to the right people." So he dresses up as a reverend, and he loads his car up with all these drugs, and he gets stopped at the border, and he's getting interrogated, and he says, "You know, they're all for personal use. Like, yes, I take a ton of drugs every day, and." The border guards are like, this is ridiculous. So obviously he's lying, but it's illegitimate for them to stop him anyway. So I didn't have any problem with him lying. Uh, either of you guys have any kind of issue with him lying to get these drugs over the border? Um, no. Yeah, I, I didn't either. So my, my career wouldn't be on the line in saying so. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, I think it's a, a situation where um, the uh, the moral compass is pointing towards helping people versus obeying some arbitrary imaginary line right. and some arbitrary rule. Um, so, absolutely. Yeah, I think there comes a point when um, even a, a department that's instituted by government that is is on its face presented as a good thing, you know, to help protect people or what have you, it gets corrupted over time and ends up being a self-serving mechanism. You know, it, it gets into that bureaucratic process that needs to justify its own existence, and it, it takes on a different uh, non-market sort of life that takes it away from its initial mission uh, if it was good to begin with. Um, I'd, I'd argue that any government program is, you know, by de facto, initiatory violence, even if they do some good out of that. Uh, they've caused a lot of harm in the unseen area. But uh, it just seemed to me that that the FDA, for whatever um, veneer that they had of, of helping people, it had long since steered away from that and was actually causing harm to to Ron and people in his position. Right. So speaking of markets, when he gets back over the border with the drugs, he goes into business because he originally he initially tries to start selling all his drugs, and you know he he hates homosexuals. It's been very established that he is very anti-homosexual. All his friends are very anti-homosexual, and he doesn't want anything to do with them. But he has all these drugs, and he has this waiting market of people that's waiting to man to buy these drugs. So in a in a way, I think, Doc, you wanted to make a point about mar- how markets bring people together. Uh, Ron actually goes and meets up back up with the Jared Leto character who gains him access to this homosexual population who have this desire for his uh, product. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the um, One of the points of the movie that uh, I saw was was how uh, trade and exchange really kind of break down a lot of stereotypes and borders and bigotry um, uh, because it uh, it kind of brings uh, people together who would otherwise wouldn't be um, and bringing it to uh, a bigger scale and bringing it to current topics with the protectionism of Donald Trump, if we want to go really big, um, and the idea... You mean mean um, huge? Huge? (laughs) Huge. Taking a huge view of everything. Uh, And just how, you know, um, oh, man, now I'm going to forget who it was that said this. Um, And I'm paraphrasing, but essentially uh, where trade flows, armies rarely go, um, because... You know, once you have a relationship, a financial relationship, um, you uh, start to uh, develop a kinship. You become kind of on the same team because you're both benefiting. And that's the kind of the, the main glory of capitalism in the markets is that uh, anytime there's a trade, it's voluntary and both uh, people benefit. Um, right. And, you have a vested interest uh, to keep the peace. Right. Vested interest to keep the peace. Uh, but even also on a psychological level, we have these biases that are uh, 
uh, called in-group, out-group biases. And so uh, early on, you see that his in-group was, you know, redneck cowboys who uh, didn't like homosexuals. The out-group was homosexuals, and, and he didn't um, uh, like them. He probably um, um, had never associated with any of them before. All of a sudden, with the, these financial transactions, um, now he begins to see everyone kind of on the same team. That becomes his in-group. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, eventually becomes almost one big happy family as much as uh, <laughs> uh, he could be happy. <laughs> right. A bunch of people uh, terminally ill and feeling feeling very awful most of the time. But, yeah, I agree. Uh, the... Um, the market brought them together, people that would not have been in any other instance uh, enjoying each other's company, but then he grew to like them right. because they were mutually benefiting each other. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, uh, you know, also um, talks about, uh, you know, the cost, uh, the, the real financial cost of bigotry and how in a free market you would see just naturally less and less of that. Whereas in a current government situation where certain groups have certain rights and privileges or certain benefits for being in certain groups, you see more and more of a isolation of these groups and more and more of people having their own specific group identity in order to curry favor uh, with the government. Um, and because, uh, I mean, you have, you know, um, all sorts of, of um, uh, uh, groups and group leaders trying to get that you know, concentrated benefit uh, from the government um, through kind of the disseminated loss of all of the taxpayers. Uh, if you can just spend a, a little bit of money on a politician at just the right time, you can get a lot of money in the future. And uh, the side effect of that is you know, these, this kind of current identity politics that we seem to have, uh, people kind of becoming more and more isolated. And that. Right. Yeah, I kind of argue that politics in general is a divisive um, process. I mean, Ron Paul excluded. Uh, you know, he, he's the reason I'm where I am today. And, and I think from your intro, you were in a similar boat there, Doc. But, I mean, pretty much anyone else in politics pretty much preys on dividing people into groups and subgroups and, you know, this group is keeping your group down and this class and that class. Like the whole Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton message. Um, and so, yeah. Donald Trump message. Yeah, social Marxism. Yeah, yeah, Donald Trump had pretty much the same message as uh, Bernie. He just was a little bit less PC about it. And I think that resonated yeah. for some reason. And yeah, they both wanted to tax the rich. Yeah, and their trade policies are strikingly similar and, and terrible. <laughs> yeah, putting all these tariffs. Yeah, it's, it's a nightmare. And he's keeping up with all the wars. He's killing people. It's great. Yeah. So anyway, um, yep. those are all great points. Let's get back to this movie here. Um, uh, so it's illegal for him to sell these drugs. Um, so what he does to get around this DEA regulation is to set up the name of the movie, the Dallas Buyers Club, where the drugs are free as long as you pay your membership dues, which are like $400 a month. Um, so you have these, you know, through government regulation, you create these weird workarounds which uh, just to get around these stupid arbitrary laws, uh, what did you guys end up thinking about his uh, solution? And, what, and I understand that the, um, the DEA has since moved to destroy these buyers clubs. Is that correct? I have not heard anything specific, but I have not heard of any buyers clubs ever. <laughs> yeah. So I so assume that assume. after this, uh, the FDA and the DEA kind of shut it down. Right. Um, I mean, these organizations, well, the DEA was really kind of coming into its own uh, through the drug war and building up a lot of clout. But, um, you know, these were uh, much smaller, less 
potent uh, organizations back then. It's amazing what uh, 30 years can do uh, to a bureaucracy and kind of their powers they keep gobbling up and assuming. Well, that's that's their very nature of how they exist, right? They they have to use up their entire budget to justify an increase in the budget for next year, and they have to increase headcount, and it doesn't matter if they're actually performing the duties that they have on their boilerplate that says what their vision is and all that. I, I recently went to DMV, and they had all these posters up about how great a service they were doing protecting consumers and drivers and how they were going to give us, like, world-class service. And I sat there for two hours and got surly <laughs> service, got a uh, half-assed picture taken of me, and I still don't have my license. It's it's in the mail. <laughs> yeah, well, when you're dealing with Monopoly, they have no incentive to provide a decent service. Cause what do they care? They're not they're not fighting for your dollars. Yeah. Well, oh, and, and one other anecdote. So <clears throat> they recently changed in, in Washington State from a five-year license to a six-year license, but apparently their computer systems can't handle it. So they have <laughs> randomly selected randomly selected people who, are, once they get the renewal, to get either three, four, or five-year licenses, and I got three. So I get to go through it again in three years instead of six. And so do you get to pay, you get the half-off cost, or do you have to pay the full price for only getting a three-year license? I paid for the number of years that the license was valid for. However, I also had to pay a penalty because um, I did it after my birthday, and then I was expired for a while. Because, uh-huh. you know, I don't feel like I need that permission, and I don't really think about it. Um, but then it dawned on me one day that, hey, if I get pulled over, it could be a, not only a big issue because of my belief system and how I would handle being with a cop, but uh, then they, you know, have a piece of paper that says that I was illegal in some fashion, so I, I, I yes. figured I'd better deal with it. So, getting back to the movie, um, so we get a series of uh, scenes where Ron is getting fairly successful. He's got a, he's got a serious clientele list, uh, a line of people outside his like hotel business room uh, that, uh, that want to buy his product, or at least sign up for his service. And and this is so, because it's now a club, right? So people are able to do it. Right. right. So he's, I have a he's little, at the Dallas Buyers Club. I have a little anecdote about that is, and I don't mean to derail you. But Go for it. Do you remember a few years ago in Washington State when it became illegal to smoke cigarettes inside of a restaurant or a bar or within 25 feet of a door or, or a window? Oh, yeah. So in Seattle, there were a lot of places that were, like, openly defying this. And they were getting in trouble. They were getting, like, police harassment and, and inspections and things like that. So what they ended up doing, some of them, they became private clubs. So they shifted from being a bar or a restaurant and said, okay, we're a private club now. So everyone pays a membership and comes in and, you know, does what they want. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know if they exist still because it's been, you know, five, six years now. But it, it, it's similar to... The concept of the Dallas Fires Club, which is, you know, obviously probably shut down by DEA and FDA. But I guess the whole smoking thing, you know, they didn't cover that one until more recently, probably. But, Indeed. but let's get back on track. Didn't mean to no, be you there. No, that's good. So we get a series of scenes where he goes and tries to get drugs to sell. He travels to Japan to speak with some Japanese doctors and manufacturers to try to get this drug called Interferon. Um, but as, after he talks to him on the phone, he flies over there, and then they tell him that it's illegal for them to export to the United States. Um, so he ends up going back to the United States, where he collapses in an airport, um, and he is recovering in the hospital. And uh, like this DEA guy is there, and he's threatening him to take his drugs away. Now, did, and, he, did he collapse because... He was feeling very terrible. He took the interferon, but he took too much because they told him that it was very powerful. And then he had like a one of those, you know, tin noises, tinnitus noises in his head, and and he inter- intravenously uh, injected some of it, but likely too much is how I read that one. Yeah, yeah it seemed to me. Uh, that, is that what you read, Doc? Yeah, he was supposed to do a slow drip. Um 
and uh, so they uh, usually have a liter of saline. They inject that little vial that he injected into himself. They inject that into the liter of saline, which then drips in over an hour. Mm. So he just kind of just mainlined uh, it. Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So okay, um, that makes sense. So he wakes up in the hospital, and there's a good little libertarian anarchist scene, uh, probably one of the most overt in the movie, although the whole movie is just straight up libertarian. Uh, he wakes up in the hospital, and he's got this uh, IV drip in his arm, or whatever, and he's like, Doc, what, what are you pumping, me, pumping into me? And Doc goes, well, it's a cocktail with AZT, and he immediately rips it out of his arm. And he says, I'm going to sue you for attempted murder for putting AZT into me. And he says, I say what goes into my body, not you. And the doctor claims that it isn't up to Ron what goes into his body, but it's up to, quote, the people in the hospital. And, of course, Ron doesn't agree with that. But uh, I think that little scene, I mean, if there's anything that goes to the core of libertarianism is that we have self-ownership. And we are the ultimate deciders on what happens to our own bodies. And the idea that any doctor is going to come in and force drug you is abhorrent to me. I mean, if anything, uh, a doctor is basically a really qualified advice giver when it comes to health. But you are the ultimate decider when it comes to your own treatment. And I just thought that scene really illustrated that. What do you guys think of that? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. I agree. <laughs> right on, buddy. Yeah, I thought there'd be more of an answer to that, but but yeah, totally agree. <laughs> right on. Okay. Good. Good enough. That's fine. Um, I don't have a whole lot for the rest of the movie. Um, the DEA actually comes and raids his business and steals his product just for being in violation of the FDA regulations. He says his like aloe vera is mislabeled. And so he says that he needs to apply to sell his products, which means that he would have to, like, give all kinds of money, like massive amounts of money to get a drug through FDA approval, which essentially is right. extortion. I mean, he's he's a businessman. He's making – he has these products, and they're just going to steal him, steal them and say, well, you can apply and give us a bunch of money, and then we may or may not say it's okay to do this. Um, he tries to file a restraining order against the government and the FDA, uh, which he ultimately loses, but I appreciate his gumption. <laughs> yes. Well, that, that brings to mind the, uh, the whole separation of powers, you know, the three uh, branches of government that are supposed to check each other. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and everyone brings that up when we talk about anarchy or libertarianism. But, I mean, look at it. It's, it's the government deciding whether the government is doing something the government should or should not be able to do. You know, right. Like, of course, they're going to allow pretty much whatever they want. There's no check. There's no balance. Right. Right. And I, I really like, even though the the labeling the aloe was such a small little part of uh, the movie, it really did illustrate the idea that, um, you know, we're constantly in violation of so many little codes and rules um, now there's so much red tape, so many little rules that at any point, if you were targeted as a political dissident or whatever, you could easily be locked up for any number of reasons. Um, and uh, um, I'm going to quote someone else who I can't remember, but <laughs> from some other book I read that I can't remember for the life of me, we'll have to put this in later, but uh, you know, I estimated that the average person breaks three different... Uh, you know, federal rules or codes every day without even realizing it. Um, and, you know, uh, and I, I thought the, uh, the aloe being mislabeled was a perfect example of, of kind of, uh, how if a, a government entity wants to get you, I mean, they certainly can. Um, and particularly now with the NSA and, uh, all of the, uh, Oversight. And yeah. Hi, hi, boys. Th- thanks for tuning in to the show tonight. <laughs> Pay attention. <laughs> hey, that reminds me of uh, you know, like a cop pulling you over for 
you know, whatever reason, they make it up and just like smashing your tail light on <laughs> on the way to the driver's driver door. Uh you know, just so they have a reason. Yeah. Yeah, and there's just absolutely oh, thousands of pages of regulation that are dumped on the American people every day. It's it's impossible. I mean, it essentially creates this army of lawyers just to keep track of all this crap, just to make sure that you're in accordance with all this these uh, with all these regulations that are just impossible to, like you said, impossible to keep up with. Or, or they're contradictory. Like you do one thing, you're breaking one. You do the opposite, you're breaking something else. Yeah, what's right. that joke of the guy who's in jail, like the price fixer versus the, you know that joke, Danny? You you, you told me that joke before. Oh, oh I yeah. Think so, I remember. Yeah, it's a, I Go think ahead. it's the Walter Block one. Because uh, three guys are in jail. I was like, well, I was, I was undercutting everyone, so they gave me, uh, you know, put me in jail for vicious price cutting and trying to, you know, take the business away from the other guys. Second guy says, well, I was trying to charge him more than everyone else. So they called me a price gouger, and uh, that I was overcharging. And then the third guy was like, "Well, I charge the same as everyone else," and they got me for collusion, for you know, price fixing with everyone else. <laughs> so right. No matter what you do, you're screwed. And granted, you know, all three of them couldn't actually exist because if one's selling the same as everyone, and then there's no way they could be different. But you know, it's an economist joke, so give it a little bit of latitude. <laughs> right. Uh, here's the uh, the. Uh, lawyer uh, Harvey Silver Glate. Um, that's on a Mises article, October 12, 2011, was talking about the three federal crimes a day. Now, anyway, is this is this doc? Is this a case of um, telephone or fish stories? Because I always recall it as three felonies a day. So three like federal rules sounds a little bit less. Uh, you know, like like the fish. Oh, I caught it with seven inches. Oh, now it's twelve inches now. You know what I mean? Like, oh, let's see. You caught a forty pound. Uh, well, <laughs> the the title of his book was called Three Felonies a Day. Um, and uh, let's see, the quote is: uh, uh, "Average person unknowingly breaks at least three federal criminal laws every day." So that doesn't yeah. even count all the non-law regulation, right? Like there's so right. many b- different bureaucracies that just come up with different rules that aren't even law. They're just regulations. So I'm sure it's even yeah. greater. Right. Now, um, back to the movie. Um, our hero is keeps trying to get like a doctor's prescription for all these drugs. And his final solution is to steal Jennifer Garner's prescription pad because he just can't get it um i had an issue with that but at the same time i mean i know she could like get fired right if if anybody finds out and, and of course it's also forgery and it's fraud but i mean if i wanted to make a case to, to for my hero to be a good guy in this situation all these rules and regulations shouldn't exist for him to just be in business um and that's not to excuse the thief the in the in the fraud, but they really got him between a rock and a hard place. So on the one hand I can't like endorse what he does. I mean there's there's no there's no winner there. There's no good guy in that situation. But I mean, did anybody else have a real big problem issue with him stealing the, the prescription pad? Yeah, that one hits a little close to the close to home. Yeah, yeah. Doc, Doc has uh, to say yes on that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I've I've had patients who've um, who forged my signatures and uh, uh, created uh, uh, created uh, prescriptions and things like that. Yeah, um, and but once again, this is is dealing with um, the. Uh, kind of the moral slippery slope that happens when you have arbitrary rules and a black market is created. I think a really great example of this, and you never know what the, the truth is of the situation, but would be um, Ross Ulbricht uh, with the um, Silk Road. I don't know mm-hmm. if you uh, followed much sure. up on that. Yeah, yeah we he's talking about um, for life, right? Yeah. Serving a life sentence so, for providing value. Right. Um but he, he creates, so he creates this, uh, uh, dark web portal for, 
uh, exchanging all things, and mostly it was uh, drugs that were exchanged. Um, but with that, living outside the law, you become more and more associated with more and more people who are more and more comfortable living outside the law. And uh, um, whether you believe or not, um, you created a situation um, where you know, he was asked uh, whether um, he should uh, have uh, some people executed within this drug world. Now, it's always tricky because the FBI agents who were overseeing that were both fired and themselves, I think, put in jail for mishandling that case and uh, stealing the Bitcoin. And yet somehow <laughs> that verdict still stands, even though the lead investigators were corrupt. I, I don't know how that works, but that's, you know, that's the government. But... um you know, just, you know, how having to you know, make these difficult choices that don't have a, um, that have moral ambiguity, I, I think is, uh, is created in having an initial morally ambiguous rule coming down from the government, putting you in a situation where you have to decide, you know, uh, which side, uh, is the lesser of two evils when in, uh, a freer market or a free market, it would be very clear. Okay, well, this is someone's private property uh, because you wouldn't have some silly rule saying, well, you can't go get this thing that's going to save your life. All of a sudden, there's a, a small rule that you need to break in order for the greater good. Well, that's forgery. Well, that's invading someone else's privacy. You know, where does that all stack? Uh, you're, not, you're not going all bent really on us, are you, Doc? You're going all what? All Bentham. What is that? Jeremy that Bentham, the, the greatest kid for the greatest number. Oh, no, I'm not. I don't know. Uh, I don't think he was making a collectivist argument. No, not a utilitarian no, not madman. <laughs> no, no. Uh, in my mind, utilitarianism requires a uh, perfect foresight into the future. <laughs> so, and nobody has that, so... Right. Uh, that's why I'm much more of a, uh, a principles kind of guy. Well, that's a whole other argument on libertarianism. <laughs> hey, we're hey. open to it. That's that's where we're at. Having principles to uh, bring to bear on any situation gives you a lot of clarity. It doesn't get you all the way there. It gets you most of the way there. Like there is always some moral ambiguity, like we were saying. But I mean, it gets you like most of the way through most situations. Yeah, and that's you know this isn't. Uh, with the movie specifically, but just going back and thinking about kind of my journey into libertarianism and, and then anarchy. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I came upon when I was really digging into the libertarianism and the um, was just a sense of peace where all of these different parts of my life all of a sudden had a common thread and it really felt kind of unifying and good. Um, where, you know, every little political argument used to be like, oh, well, boy, how do I feel about that? I hadn't really thought about that. Well, I don't know. And now I can kind of bring it back, like, okay, well, you know, what are the principles of the situation? Where's the force? Where's the violence? Is this voluntary? You know, that, that, um, just brings so much clarity to any type of argument, um, really just freed up kind of my mind space and a lot of cognitive dissonance that I didn't even realize I had. Um, That's a very good point. I mean, I think a lot of people do look at each isolated incident or event in its own little vacuum, and right. they don't consider, you know, any underlying principles to it. So that's how they end up with that cognitive dissonance, where they have very contradictory opinions about things um, that they – don't see. Yeah, like, I think a um, lot of people. Yeah, I think a yeah, lot of people end up kind of relying on their group identification. Once again, you know, oh, I'm Democrat. What do the Democrats say? Okay, well, I'm for that. I was just in a argument on Facebook. Of course, we all get in these <laughs> uh -huh. with a former classmate, and um, uh, she's um, you know progressive, liberal. I don't know. Um, 
she was into Bernie, but I'm sure she voted for Hillary, um, just because that was the thing to do. Um, and she was against Betsy DeVos and framed it in the school choice type of a situation. How, you know, why could, you know, how could you possibly have school choice? You have to support the public schools. Uh, I'm not a strong school choice advocate. Some choice is better than no choice. Um, but I just framed it as uh, playing dumb. I was just like, uh, I thought that school choice was the progressive thing. I don't, I don't understand. Uh, aren't, aren't liberals for school choice? It's like, oh no, no, of course not. And you know, I go back and forth a little bit. I'm just trying to dig out this information of getting her to think about, you know, what is the principle of this that she's ag- yeah. against. And finally, I was just like, I mean, I don't, I don't see. You know, this is, this is an opportunity <laughs> to have, you know, you could create a school specifically for bullied, uh, uh, LGBTQ, L, L, I forgot all the names. It's the whole alphabet it's now. It, it's, it's the impossible. whole alphabet now. It, it really is. <laughs> you know, all, all, you know, specifically for those groups or, um, someone else had chimed in how she used to work for a, a charter school that was for um, uh, specifically for pregnant uh, teen moms or soon to be moms, um, and it was very poorly run, and you know uh, she was had nothing but bad things to say about this charter school. Um, but these kids were kicked out of every other school, and this was their only choice. And I was just like, how is it not progressive to have the option of these small little micro schools that would fit the needs of those students. I, I just couldn't understand how that wasn't a progressive ideal. And of course I got no response. <laughs> that well, was the know, last course, comment. <laughs> my body, my choice, but my school, my choice. No, no, sorry. That's where you draw the line. Yeah. Right. Where my body goes or what I do. And if I happen to do something that generates money, well, then all of a sudden you get that portion of what my body did. I mean, it's just, uh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's, it's almost impossible to dissect and to discern what the actual principle at play is because there so often isn't a principle at play. It's just, does this benefit me? Yes. Yeah. It's, okay, it's usually, sure. it's usually what Robert and I get, which is you're a fucking white male. <laughs> Therefore your argument is invalid. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's, yeah. No, there's no principle at play. Well, yes, it's a bunch of nonsense. And that is, you know, one of the frustrating things about libertarianism. And the one thing that I don't understand is why isn't this um, grassroots minority-driven uh, um, movement? I, I don't understand why this is uh, uh, is not really taking hold in the historically oppressed. Um, historically oppressed by the government. I don't, right. it, doesn't, it doesn't make uh, sense to me. I think it's a case of George Orwell, where everything that's oppressing them is couched in benevolent terms, and so they don't see the harm that's being done to them because the name of the bill is the help you out bill. Right. Because you know? like, yeah. a lot of the, the harm that is befalling on people in these uh, more oppressed by government I don't know what you call, like demographics. It, it's all in terms of, oh, we're helping you, you know, welfare, or oh, the minimum wage, you know, we're going to raise the minimum wage to help you guys out. Well, what does it do? It disemploys people, you know. People it with, makes jobs illegal. Yeah, it makes, makes accepting a wage illegal uh, unless they can provide more value than, you know, whatever that determined, determined wage, the arbitrary wage happens to be. Um, right. But for whatever reason, they stick up for it because they, they think, for whatever reason, they think that, well, I'm not part of the group that's going to lose the job. I'm part of the group that's going to get this higher wage than I otherwise would get. But right. it rarely works out that way. You know, and, of course, the drug war, um, we've been talking about drugs, you know, pretty much related to this movie. But the drug war and the illicit drug trade, um, I I feel, is, is one of the most um, racially divisive things out there, you know, because... I mean, if you think about it in economic terms, they take away all the opportunity to do something productive, like you're priced out of getting a job, 
Uh, you're put in these crappy public schools. The alternative is, okay, I'm going to sell drugs that are artificially inflated in price due to a war to keep them down. Right. To get the, yeah, the, the uh, supply artificially low. Yeah, yeah. So the price is high. Uh, so it's an attractive thing to do given that their alternatives have been removed from them. You know, any outstanding Absolutely. alternatives. Have you read that uh, Freakonomics? Yeah, yeah, it's well? been a while. Yeah, they had that really um, interesting case of that um, uh, drug lord. I think it was in Chicago, and he uh, was uh, had his degree in business, and he decided, well, I'm going to be a drug lord. So he kept meticulous notes, and he was paying his uh, these kids to sell drugs like uh, two dollars an hour equivalent of two dollars an hour and uh a quarter of them died and that just shows that you know i mean the minimum wage is set way too high these kids are willing to work for two dollars an hour at a 25 right. percent mortality just yeah the risk of dying <laughs> right wow i mean it's it's uh desperation it's ridiculous and now they're stuck in that situation they have to be more brutal to climb the ladder because now that's their only route because once they've kind of chosen that black market, they don't have any, they aren't learning any skills that are applicable to go get a job at Wendy's. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's just a real tragedy. Yeah. Now is the drug war, is that more of a um, Reagan thing or was that like before that? Was that a Nixon thing, Carter thing? When was yeah, it escalated? It, Nancy really popularized it, but I mean, she used to like to just say no. But the drug war didn't it? Yeah, start a little bit earlier than that, or did it? It started earlier, but Reagan definitely did ramp it up. I mean, he had that. Um, that's where the CIA really did a lot of things, and the rumors are they started bringing in drugs, and they basically it wasn't that what the Iran Contra affair was. Um, yeah, they were selling drugs they, they, to to get arms. For the Sandinistas, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, it was really complex. <laughs> um, yeah, and, you know, that's also when um, uh, they started uh, clamping down on cocaine. And in the 80s, the cocaine wasn't considered a hard drug, you know, uh, and it became, you know, went similar to a lot of other um Drugs, when they start being imported through illegal channels, they need to become more potent, more concentrated, so that they can be snuck in easier in a smaller package uh, and less expensive, and ends up making them more and more dangerous. And so you get the evolution of this crack cocaine, and then leading into what you're talking about with this disparity of uh, minorities um, being caught with crack cocaine, penalized much heavier than powder cocaine. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's very little um, difference in the high that it performs or the, the drug itself, uh, according to studies. Uh, so it, it's just one of those things that all of a sudden crack cocaine is a problem directly because powder cocaine is illegal and now it's much less expensive. So uh, the people that are uh, abusing that are lower income and now... Minorities get all caught up in it, and inner city rot, and it's just it's just amazing how that all progresses. I mean, it's uh, all through government fiat. Yeah, yeah. But also just the kind of the example of one thing kind of leading to another, the solution of one thing being the the problem, the the next problem. Um, well, and maybe Doc, you could speak to this a little bit. It's just the arbitrariness to which the FDA or the DEA, they just, you know, declare one thing harmful and another thing beneficial, where we have a prescription drugs which kill, I don't know how many people, and things like marijuana or kratom or other such, you know, kind of like, I don't know, almost like herbal type things, don't kill people, and yet they're only recently right. becoming not illegal. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, you trace it back to what... Uh you know, which, you know, specific chemicals were uh, uh, declared to be illegal and which weren't. And, you know, the drug of choice for the 
the white male was the alcohol and drug of choice for minorities. You know, the Chinese immigrants was opium. Um, and uh, uh, the shoeshine boy, African-American shoeshine boy, having a little bit of cocaine, a bump of cocaine to sell to people, you know, that becomes illegal. This is just historically. <laughs> I'm not saying that every, you know what I'm saying. But, I mean, that was very much a uh, commonplace, you know, back in the 20s and 30s. Um, and then uh, marijuana being used um, more by minorities than by whites. And uh, alcohol is legal. At least, I mean, it was illegal for a little while. But uh, but the others continue to be illegal. Um and, you know, people oftentimes make the correlation of, of, uh, of uh, marijuana being safer than alcohol and why is marijuana illegal. Um, you can also do that with, with other drugs. Um, much harder drugs than what you would think, uh, including opioid type, uh, drugs. Um, and this is where it gets really <laughs> out there in, in terms of the current consensus of medical professionals, but uh, let's just look at uh, alcohol versus um, opioids, um, uh, heroin if you have a clean needle or something like that. Um, let's take the overdose. So it's about a wash there. You can have an overdose and die on alcohol. You can have an overdose and die on, on opioid-type medication. Um, so um, long-term consequences. Um, you certainly can have lower testosterone, increased depression with uh, opioids, increases your pain sensitivity to, with addiction to opioids. Um, alcohol, well, you can have an encephalopathy where your brain just basically rots. Um, so, you know, evidently opioids in chronic terms are safer than if you're a chronic alcoholic. Um, so let's look at uh, withdrawals. If you want to stop or you run out of your product, uh, alcohol, alcohol is much riskier in a withdrawal situation. People can have seizures. People can die. People uh, tend to do much better with an opioid-type withdrawal. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. I and mean, if you're frail and elderly and you withdrawal, you can have electrolyte abnormalities just from the too much vomiting um, and diarrhea. But it's not thought of as being a medical emergency to have a withdrawal off of opioids like it is off of alcohol. Um, so even the, these harder drugs that we think of as being uh, so unbearably dangerous that we can't have them legal um, are safer than legal drugs like alcohol. And uh, it really is uh, arbitrary. And you also have to think, I mean, the um, the main oh problems uh, with a lot of these drugs and addiction in general um, is not necessarily some magic in the chemical itself. I and mean, there's a lot of things that kind of stimulate our addiction pathways, stimulate those dopamine receptors in our brain that make us want to do things again and again. Um, and anything can kind of be caught up in that. I mean, there's gambling addicts, sex addicts, food addicts. Um, and oftentimes it comes down to, you know, early childhood trauma, um, you know, previous traumatic experiences that we're coping. We're un- we don't want to unpack that past to uh, really deal with, so we're just masking that with some type of pleasurable activity, whatever it happens to be. You know, are you going to make food illegal? Well, they're kind of making <laughs> bad food illegal. Um, they do. They have in many cases. We... We've covered it a little bit on the podcast and a little bit on the website uh, where France just recently made it illegal to offer unlimited refills and uh, soda. (laughs) And, you know, like Giuliani in uh, New York where he says you can't sell soda in, you know, large containers or... Yeah, no big gulps. Yeah, making food illegal. Well, that's another thing if we want to talk about modern medicine and just socialized medicine. I mean, that's... when, When you're talking about you know, freedoms and things like that, and, and people are talking about health care. As soon as you have a one-size-fits-all, all all of a sudden, I have a say in your health. Because if we're all in this together, all of a sudden, I can tell you 
and have moral grounds to tell you you're too fat. You need to exercise more. I'm not going to pay for your cancer treatment. I'm not going to do this because you smoked when you were younger. You know, and all of a sudden, since everyone's paying for it, everyone has a say in it. And it just really creates a lot of conflict and moves you into a conflict situation instead of a generous situation. Mm-hmm. You know, when people are, are sick and you're, you're donating money. I mean, you know, if you look at a, a map of hospitals in whatever your town is, uh, just look at how many of those have a religious background. You know, you have these huge Catholic systems, um, you know, Adventist health systems, Baptist systems. Um, these were all started as charity hospitals. And now there are these huge behemoth, multi-million, uh, multi-billion dollar industries because they've kind of been corrupted by this, you know, nationalization of healthcare. And it's, it really is, is tragic that, you know, this thing that the United States was known for, this, this charity, this dramatic, um, network of charity hospitals that people could go to when they were sick and receive free or very low cost care, uh, because the parishioners were donating money. Uh, that's all gone. I mean, you have basically the Shriners hospital system and that's it. Um, and that's the last kind of true charity hospital, large charity hospital situation that we still have. Um, but all these, you know, uh, places that we used to think of as, as being charity hospitals are now these big places paying their CEOs millions of dollars a year just to, you know, manage. And it's just, uh, unfortunate. There is some, Small vestiges, as I understand it, uh, I think I saw a video of Stefan Molyneux talking about um, some free market hospitals and some free market healthcare providers in the United States. I think he went mm-hmm. down to like Oklahoma, where you basically yeah, did, Oklahoma surgery. Yeah, like uh, a la carte. Hey, I want this treatment, and here's the price. And yeah, he got his a, cancer surgery there, and it's just a whole lot cheaper. Um, I don't know if you know a whole lot about that, Doc. Uh, yes, absolutely. Well, I wouldn't say a whole lot, but yeah, I mean, they just, um, um, the Oklahoma Surgery Center posts all their prices. It's, uh, you know, um, a flat rate. If, uh, you end up needing more care than that, then they bite the bullet on that. Um, and it's quite a bit less expensive. Um, uh, if, if you were to have to pay cash at like a normal hospital, and it's probably a quarter or a fifth of what you'd be asked initially to pay cash. Um, now, if you went into a hospital and you said, I had no insurance, what is it, cash? And they did some surgery and said, okay, well, you owe $80,000. <laughs> you know, $80,000 is, is not at all unheard of for some type of a surgery mm-hmm. because that's the billed amount. Um, because all of the collections are it, it's kind of a a weird uh, vestige of how Medicare <laughs> originally started, and uh, that's another interesting thing about these bureaucracies: how little bits kind of are held on, and you, later on you see the results, and you just have no idea where it started. But that book by Dr. Uh, Robert Murphy, uh, the Primal Prescription, the first half of that does a really good job just laying out kind of. Uh, American healthcare and kind of how it all happened and how we got this crazy system. Um, but when Medicare first came out, um, a lot of the doctors really rejected it. They did not feel that that was an appropriate system. Uh, and so they said, well, whatever you bill us, we will pay. And that perked up doctors' ears. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that doesn't really encourage, uh, conserving and being super efficient with your practices. Right. So um, uh, then they started accepting Medicare. And uh, then, and, and I think the, um, I can't remember if it was, it was, a, it was a, a different book. There's another book called uh, How the FTC Took Over Healthcare. That kind of, uh, but anyway, um, uh, it was talking about how it was a 
pretty small percentage of doctors who were you know, grossly overbilling, something like 1%. Um, but you could bill whatever, and then Medicare would give you that amount. And then they said, well, okay, well, we're, we're not going to do all of that. We just have to have this one big price structure, and we have to average out per region what it usually costs. And, you know, it, it just became this crazy system, all because 1% of doctors were abusing the system. Mm-hmm. And so it's like how much more expensive has Medicare become uh, they could have just said, all right, well, 1% is going to cheat everybody. All right, well, that's the cost of uh, having a stupid rule. <laughs> and would have been much better off uh, as far as overall expenses. But now they have this crazy system. And so the billing rate uh, and what you get compensated for, there's all of these different uh, rules with um, some... Uh, uh, insurance companies will pay you a certain percentage of what you bill. Other insurance companies will pay you a percentage above Medicare rates. And then Medicare, every uh, three or four years, um, does a survey of how much they're getting billed, and they adjust their prices of what they compensate based on what doctors are billing out there. So every doctor typically sets their cash price not at what they think they deserve. They just set it at two times, three times, four times, whatever Medicare is paying in hopes that next time the survey comes along, all their stuff gets bumped up a bit. So that's how Mm. all of these cash prices have no market bearing whatsoever. So you go and you have some some surgery, they say $80,000, and they say, well, I don't don't have anything. Uh, Say, well, what can you give us? Um, we can, you know, slice this down quite a bit and work with you um, because they also know that their cash price is, is completely made up out of thin air. Hmm. Um, and then they'll give you a social worker and say, all right, well, let's get you on these government programs because as soon as we get you on this government program, then we build the government. So it's just, uh, you know, there's just kind of this funnel straight into uh, government programs because of outrageously high non-market prices, and it's uh, crazy. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Oklahoma Surgery Center has um, done away with all that flat fee, and I think air travel is even included in their fee. Like, they'll fly you in, do the surgery, watch you for a couple of days, and fly you out. Interesting. You know, <clears throat> my layperson perspective has always been that they'll bill for some high fee hoping that they'll get some percentage of that from the insurance company. And so that's why the bills would be so high if it's cash price, but then, of course, they'll settle with you and deal with you down the line if they need to. I mean, of course, they'll accept eight Correct. grand if you'll pay it. <laughs> right. They'll send you the collections a couple times to get that 80 grand, but then they'll work with you. Yeah, and it, but, you know, some of the insurances are, are like that, where they do a percentage. Um, but a lot of them have moved away from that because it's just so much easier to say, you know, now that Medicare is ubiquitous, to say, okay, well, what is Medicare? We'll pay 120% of Medicare. And, you know, that's, um, you know, something that you'll you'll kind of see. Yeah, I mean, talk about a bureaucratic engine for the growth of, of price increases. I mean, that's, that's incredible. You know, and then you talk about... Yeah. Um, insur- the insurance model, which isn't insurance at all, I mean, it's like getting oil change insurance for your car, um, you're increasing right. the demand for the services, and then on the back end, you've restricted supply, right, with all the licensing regulations, and, you know, 100 years ago, the Rockefeller Center shut down half of the medical schools in the country because they were homeop- homeopathy versus allopathy, and they had a bunch of drug interests. Um, Rothbard has a lecture that covers a bit of this. Um, I don't know if, Doc, you have a whole bunch of uh, background on that or not, but it, it just seems to be a case of, of increasing demand on one end, decreasing supply on the other, and then this whole bureaucratic system where there's like three or four ways of just making the costs increase on top of each other, you know, just 
with no real market mechanism to slow it down or or abate it in any way. Right. Yeah, and everybody in, in government is shocked. Well, you know, why, are, why are prices going up? Must be people were greedy. And, well, <laughs> I mean, of, of the truly rich people in the world, uh, you know, besides, you know, the oil barons and, you know, Russia that were, uh, you know, the, uh, that guy down in Mexico that, you know, gets all these government contracts and whatnot. I mean, but like in the U.S., the people who have really made the most money, going all the way back to the robber barons, it's because they've provided a product that people wanted for a price less than others. And if you want to be really rich, make something that costs less. And, uh, it's just, you know, time and time again, um, the best way to be greedy is to make something less expensive. <laughs> Provide more value. <laughs> yeah, that's a good want. point. I mean, the, the whole robber baron myth can be a, an entire show or five. Um, but yeah, you yeah. bring up a good point. Like, they were considered terrible people, but all they did was lower the prices of the goods that they provided faster and save than the, anyone else. Save the whales. Save the whales. <laughs> yeah, they saved like so many whales. It's ridiculous. You know, all the environmentalists yeah. should be like praising uh, like Rockefeller. Nelson, Rock, and, yeah, Rockefeller for making oil cheap enough to move away from whale oil. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh man, we could just go on about uh, the robber barons. <laughs> I will just say one thing. I was listening to a podcast of uh, Dr. Drew Pinsky. Do you know who that is, Dr. Drew of uh, Yeah, Loveline? Loveline. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 big big time lefty. <laughs> yeah, he has um, uh, a podcast um, that's more, you know, it talks about addiction and it brings on some, um, you know, researchers and things like that. And so I listened to that. He had... Uh, uh, Anderson Cooper on one time and he was talking to him and he was talking about his background and, and Anderson Cooper's a Vanderbilt. Did you know that? Yeah, he's like uh, Glory Vanderbilt's kid or something like that. Cousin oh. or nephew. I, I thought you were talking about the yeah, university, but no, like the uh, Glory of Yeah, he's, he's, yeah he's, he's one of the heirs to the Vanderbilt uh, fortune. Okay. And so he was he was talking about that and um he was just so dismissive of the, of Vanderbilt, the, uh, and it was like, well, you know, he was, um, you know, he was a really mean guy. And I was like, mean guy. All right. I mean, it, it just kind of shows how, you know, a mean guy in the free market makes travel ridiculously inexpensive and <laughs> donates a huge fortune to start a well-known uh, college. In university, and a mean guy in the government realm, you know, kills six million Jews or starves his population, and you know, or has a cultural revolution and, and kills off uh, you know fifty million Chinese. So mean guy free market stuff gets cheaper. Mean guy government people die. Yeah, everybody's <laughs> life improves versus everybody gets murdered. It's uh, <laughs> there's no contest. I'm sorry. Yeah, we talked about that a yeah. little bit in in a, an episode we did for Christmas about Scrooge. You know, he was a mean, surly dude, but our argument was that he was providing value because customers were coming to him. You know, and and with him dying or not being there, they would have had less attractive options available to them. Right. So by default, yeah. he was the better option. Like if he had them as customers. And so surly or not. Right. He was providing value. He was actually helping people more than anyone would have realized. You know, I mean, the whole, well, I mean, that was just a propaganda piece to begin with. That was one of the topics we discussed. But, yeah, it kind of falls in line with what you're saying here. Yeah, and it's not altruism that motivates people to create value. I mean, you're, you want to get paid. You want to do well for yourself. But you end up making everybody else's life better. It's not through right. altruism. It's through, I mean, you can call it greed if you want, but it's it's through self improvement. Yeah, and who isn't greedy? Well, okay. You know, like I mean, you, you look at uh, the Bernie Sanders of the world. Are they not greedy? They want you well, to pay more for free stuff. How is that not greedy? Well, they're greedy for other people's money, and apparently that's perfectly fine. Yeah. 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 
Well, hey, I think we uh, we lost our movie a while back, so anyone remember where we were? And then we can start to wind this one down. We've been going for a while here. Well, the end of the movie, um, we, we were up to the point where, uh, well, let's just talk about the end of the movie. Uh, he goes to... He goes to a trial. He finally gets a, a court date against the the FDA or the DEA to um, basically allow him to pursue his own health and to decide what you know drugs he could put in his own body and that sort of thing. And so he's in at the trial, and the judge just basically makes the argument that yeah, you should be able to do all that, but I don't have the political authority to make that decision. So I dismiss this case, fine for the uh, DEA, and so he loses his case, and that's basically the end of the movie. I mean, he dies seven years after he was given 30 days to live. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, um, it's a, a wonderful example of kind of legislated law versus discovered law, uh, where you know, and discovered law or like English common law or things like that where, you know, trial after trial, they, they have these uh, precedent and what's come, you know, the, the, uh, if you were to have an actual free market in, uh, solving disputes, you, you know, that judge would, would be able to say, well, you've come to me, you've paid for my counsel on this. I adjudicate for this person because that's the right thing. I mean, that's the law that's been discovered because that's the justice um, versus the legislated top-down. You know, this is the law that we have created, and now your sense of justice has to fit within that. Uh, right. I think is is a perfect example of, of kind of um, uh, of how the difference between um, the current justice system versus a free market justice system, where you could go to you know, whatever, um, you know, come upon an agreement of whichever uh, court system you wish to uh, help adjudicate your dispute. If there would even be a dispute. I mean, this whole thing uh, hinges upon people interfering with other people's freedoms. And there's right. so I mean, many uh, He wasn't hurting so anybody. That, right. <laughs> there was no, there was so there was no property that, damage. That, uh, right, that wouldn't even need to be adjudicated. Uh, people, you know, one of the Big concerns, I think, of a lot of minarchists and libertarians before moving to that full anarchy idea is, you know, what would we do without a top-down justice model? Um, and, you know, for people who think that government does things wrong, to then say that, well, the most important thing, which is discovery of justice, we're going to give that to the government? No, I'll, right. I'll give the government making roads. Government can have roads. I'll keep private justice. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to decide that, you know, having a top down government non-voluntary system is the way to go, uh, you know, it, it, um, it just, it just seems that the most important things, policing, justice, you know, those would be the, the ones that you'd really want to have in the free market since the free market does things so much better. And I don't yeah, understand why minarchists kind of pick those two things, you know, um, protection of property with police and, and uh, the decision of justice. Why those two things? And why, why not health care? Why not roads? And you know, why do those have to be free market? You know, it's just, uh, once again, getting to the principles. Uh, I like principles. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, I think that's where Ayn Rand and, and the minarchists go wrong is is that, you know, I mean, if, if you have a, a monopoly control on law and adjudication, then you basically have, over time, control over pretty much everything. So absolutely, to not have that in a free market situation is is you know kind of the linchpin of the whole operation. Yeah, she she recognized that markets do everything better, but for some whatever reason, she decided that yeah, these these certain things needed to be done by government and under monopoly. I, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Yeah, well, that was how Rothbard converted. He was so convinced on everything else, and that was the one last thing holding him back. And he was like, well, that was his, his argument, was, well, if, if there's a monopoly and the monopolies are bad in every other instance, why would a monopoly not be bad here? That's what flipped him over to being an anarchist. Yeah. And but, probably uh, why they didn't get along. 
<laughs> anyway, so let's get a uh, final thoughts question. on this. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Dan. What? Well, and that and the religious question. Um, but, you know, b- uh, before we wrap up the movie, I wanted to bring up one thing that uh, they had the um, FDA and the DEA come after him, and he was telling them to fuck off. Right. Uh, but eventually they brought the IRS after him. And he was like, oh, this is how you guys brought down Capone, right? Because they were bringing all of his documents out and, you know, just taking all of his uh, information. And I, I felt that that was like a point that we should bring up in the movie that, or in the show that, you know, if they, if they don't get you one way, they'll try another way. That's, that's uh, the bureaucratic government method, right? Right. Yeah. And that dovetails in nicely to the scandal that happened under the last administration of, you know, specifically targeting certain groups with IRS scrutiny. Um, you know, that IRS is a, uh, a dangerous tool. Right. Well, its we- very nature is, of course, abhorrent, but yes, it, it also can be used as a bludgeon. <laughs> yeah. It is, I mean, I'm um, meticulous. I mean, if you, if you, if you hold, uh, ideas that are outside the three by five card, I mean, you have to be meticulous on following the rules, IRS, everything, even if it pains you to no end to write those really big checks out for <laughs> To, to the government, uh, just so that they can use that money to go bomb poor brown people. You know, it, um, uh, but, you know, it's, it's one of those things you, you just really gotta cross your T's and dot your I's. Um, and it's, uh, tough situation. Yeah, I agree. So, so let's, um, let's, yeah, do the wrap up there, Robert. Well, I was just gonna get some final thoughts, Daniel. I mean, I know, I thought this was like a well-made movie, well acted, and uh, by far the most libertarian movie I'd ever seen. What what were your did you what did you think on that on that aspect? It was just it just seemed to be just two hours of libertarianness. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I was a big fan of, yeah. of how he was making his own decisions, and and he had like uh, Doc was saying earlier, you know, he had that vested interest in learning more and more about the disease he was afflicted with, and I think Hayek would call that the tacit knowledge. You know, there's no way that any central authority could know everything there is to know about everything. I mean, that's what they try to teach you in, in medical school, right? You said you went to school for 13 years, and you had a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and when someone comes to you with something like super specific, you know a little bit about it, but you haven't specialized necessarily in that one thing unless it's, you know, like, uh, what is it, you're, you're in... Um, Pain and uh, addictive things, is that right? But, but I, I guess the point is, like, unless you you are highly specified in the one area where they are, right. then, you know, you only have a, a general knowledge about many of the other things that, that may be afflicting them. And So that was kind of one of the things I took away from not only the movie, but also this conversation. So I, I really appreciate you coming on, Doc. This, is, uh, this has been great. Indeed. Here, yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really thought uh, the acting, Jared Leto nailed it, and McConaughey, I mean, yeah. Even the the hillbillies, I mean, I'm from the, the Midwest, and I, so, I mean, that, <laughs> <laughs> the they, uh, uh, they kind of nailed <laughs> the uh, the redneck culture there. Mm-hmm. And of course, that's, uh, they're talking Texas, and, you know, the... Midwest rednecks, of course, are better than the Texas rednecks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, and once again, regionalism, in-group, out-group bias. I still there have you it. go. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, and uh, if any listeners are out there um, who have been also inspired by Ron Paul, uh, I'd encourage them to, to like a, a, a new web page I've created. Um, and a Facebook page called Honoring Ron Paul. I'd like people to, to post their, um, uh, their experiences, anything that they've created. Eventually I'd like to have a list of, um, all of this kind of outgrowth of the education that, um, uh, Ron Paul brought because, uh, uh, his main thing was that, you know, the, it's a, it's a battle of ideas. Um, the battle of education, 
and uh, he's getting a little older now. And I think it would be really nice to have a cohesive list of everything that's kind of come out of his work and that uh, people may not even be aware of. It might just be, you know, I I haven't been doing that much um, politically, but, you know, I wrote this article that got published in a newspaper or I made this web page or I went and studied economics or I went and did this uh, or I became a podcaster. Um and just having a, a big comprehensive list of all the, the products that have been created um, because of Ron Paul's legacy, I think it would be a really nice thing. So feel free, like the Facebook page, post your story there. I'll, I'll, I can get that transferred over to Honoring Ron Paul. Email support at honoringronpaul.com. Um, go to the web page. It's very, <laughs> very basic. I've also just started a very basic web page called Dac, uh, sorry, DocAnarchy.com. Um, just getting into this in between all the other stuff I do. <laughs> and that's DocAnarchy.com? Correct. Cool. Yeah, and, and we look forward to um, you writing some uh, some articles, and we will definitely host them over at ActualAnarchy.com. We'd be more than happy to. You've been a, an excellent guest, and, and we think a lot of people would be more interested in hearing your thoughts on uh, pretty much anything going forward. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, sir. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, well, uh, thank you, listeners, as well, for sticking with us through uh, a fairly long one here. Um, we've had Doc Anarchy here with Robert and myself. This has been the Actual Anarchy Podcast. Uh, we have launched the site officially. We've got uh, 60 or so articles. We've got a bunch of writers contributing content. It became like a spontaneous thing. Uh, we just expected to to mostly host the podcast there with a couple of, you know, articles here and there between Robert and I. But it has blown up into a big deal. And, uh, you know, if, if anyone has, out there is uh, interested in contributing content, we are more than welcome to uh, entertaining that. Um, we've got a stable of writers now, and we look to continue to grow that. So uh, actualanarchy.com, check it out. Uh, we also run readrothbard.com. That's book selection articles by Murray N. Rothbard. He's been the inspiration behind much of what we do and what we talk about. And, uh, you know, I just want to say thank you very much for sticking with us. Uh, like us, rate us, share us, uh, whatever you do on iTunes and Facebook. Uh, we're going to be uh, looking to get in that new and noteworthy area and um, under the new uh, brand name of Actual Anarchy. So thank you very much, folks. Robert, Have a good night, everybody. Yeah, peace us out. All right. Chipmunks. C H I P M U N K. We're the chipmunks. Guaranteed to brighten your day. Do 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 do